towards lights. Okay. Yeah, just, just these in the front, I guess, would be okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I'm going to start talking about the single cell. I've actually been working in this area since I was a grad student in Len Herzenberg's lab. Um, Len, you might know, who died recently, uh, developed the fluorescence-activated cell sorter. So for many years, it was, I would say, the premier proteomics device. I mean, it was generating data uh, in the certainly high megabyte and low gigabyte back in the early 80s, back when, frankly, everything was being stored on tape, if you can imagine that. Um, and uh, we still had a computational problem of how to think about the complex relationships of the markers that were being expressed on cells, and then how in a population of a, of a mixed population of the immune system or the immune system infiltrating tumors, how do you relate uh, the expression levels of, of proteins on one cell to those on another? Frankly, the computational abilities and means just weren't available back then. But the problems had been laid out, and it really has only been in the last 10 years or so uh, that frankly due to efforts in the genomics field mostly, that some of the computational means have become available to, to understand what uh, all of this means. But the problem was even in traditional flow cytometry, the number of parameters that you could measure on a per cell basis was limited. It was say three to five parameters uh, at a time. Even today, 10 to 12 parameters on a per cell basis is the high art for, for many laboratories. Um, so I, I've been on a never-ending mission to increase the number of parameters we could measure on a per cell basis. Uh, and I'll show you some of the advances that we've made uh, since then. And then I'll point you towards where I think even the genomics field as it starts to do more and more, uh, say, transcripts on a per cell basis, the, some of the things that can be achieved once you can get to that level of clarity of vision of large cell populations. 50, 100, even 1,000 cells doesn't cut it. I'm sorry. You need 50,000 or more to start to get the statistical value that I think uh, drives some of the things I'll show you today. Okay, so uh, the flow cytometric approach that we've developed in, uh, is called mass cytometry. And essentially what we do here is we replace fluorophores with isotopes um, from the bottom of the periodic table. The isotopes are the unique labels that we use. The workflow is pretty comparable to standard uh, flow cytometry. You have antibodies to which you attach a tag. You stain the cells with the antibodies. It can be at basically any binding age. It can also be antisense RNA as you'll see in a few minutes. Uh, those are then, uh, those cells are then passed uh, through a flame here. It's a 7,500 degree Kelvin plasma, uh, which basically annihilates every one of those cells into a cloud of ions. And then the ions that once were the cell pass into a mass spectrometer here, which measures uh, essentially the isotopes here that are attached to the antibodies, which are attached to the epitope on or in a cell. Uh, and so with this, we can get quantitative information of a rate of about 500 cells per second uh, uh, to then quantify the various cell populations, the heterogeneity that, that's in the cell populations um, at a very highly quantitative level. Uh, and with this, as you'll see, we can get up to about 50 to 100 parameters measured per cell. And with the new secondary ion mass spec device that we're getting, we can actually get to an infinite, as you'll see, number of parameters measured on a per cell basis. Okay, so part of what my discussion is going to be about today is the complexity of the interactions between the immune system uh, and, the, uh, and cancer. There's the innate and there's the adaptive response uh, of the immune system itself. And then uh, within the context of the cancer, there's all of the various tissues and pseudo tissues that are created uh, by the cancer to support its own growth uh, that needs to be understood if we're ever to attempt to eradicate uh, this in a mechanism-based manner, right? You have to understand the mechanism to be able to design tools targeted at some elements of those mechanisms. So the issue is not just the bulk of the tumor. People are interested as well in the rare cells. So we, of course, have to have uh, approaches and technologies which will allow us to call out amongst all of this complexity the rare cell, and then to look inside of that cell or on that cell at the biology of it, uh, the proteins, looking at things that might be of interest 
to us in there, but then moving forward towards everything from the phosphoprotein epitopes, messenger RNA protein-protein contacts, and even ultrastructural understanding of what's going on down at the level of the single cell, and then working back upwards uh, towards how cells talk to each other. So the issue is we need additional parameters to explore the unknown biology. Again, five to seven is not going to, not going to work. So the devices that we've been working with, cytometry, time of flight, this multiplexed ion beam imaging, this thing is about the size of a truck. Uh, and unfortunately, that was our first one. The new one will be about a desktop unit that we're building. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then some of the technologies that we've been developing to go further than just protein. Uh, everything from DNA uh, protein binding using proximity ligation, largely developed by Ulf Landrigan's laboratory, but adapted by us to do also subcellular localization assays. We've got this working very nicely. Uh, and then also what we call an RNA ligation assay, where again we use a proximity effect to get an amplified signal directly off of RNA without even having to go through um, reverse transcription. Right? So we want to basically pull all of these things together. Right, so as I mentioned before, the fluorescence spectrum is limited, largely because it's crowded. Signals merge into each other's. Mass cytometry, as we published in Science several years ago now, shows that we can use multiple discrete uh, um, isotopes of ions to uh, replace the fluorophores, and each of these essentially becomes a different color. Um, no compensation and zero uh, autofluorescence, so that allows us to overcome a lot of the limitations here as well. So again, we use isotopes, right? Different elements come in multiple flavors. Um, this is what's available to us with the mass cytometer using time of flight, and with the new MIBI device, the molecular ion beam imaging, uh, it allows us actually to reach up into the rest of the periodic table up here as well pretty readily. So how do we, how do, we do this? So we start with perturbations, right? The idea behind the perturbations is that I can't necessarily know what it is you're thinking unless I ask you a question, right? So if I were to place tags somewhere on your neurons in your brain, right, little uh, um, tags that would light up as information was processing through that part of the brain, and I were to ask you a question or challenge you, uh, various parts of your brain would light up, and I might be able to derive an understanding of how you think, right, what your signaling network is on how you operate. So we do the same thing with the cells. We do the perturbations of the cells, uh, say with cytokines or drugs. We cross-link the cells with paraformaldehyde or glutaraldehyde, permeabilize the cell membrane, uh, and that allows us then to stain with the antibodies that are either against the cell surface or intracellular phosphoepitopes or even staining against the RNAs, as I alluded to. Um, how do we get the isotopes onto the uh, antibodies? We start with a chelator, which captures the uh, ion itself, and then we have multiple chelators on a um, chemical backbone, and this, it's a, basically an acrylamide-like backbone, which you can get about 30 or so of these chelators onto them uh, with the uh, um, isotope attached here. Uh, and then you attach several of these then to an antibody by traditional malayamide chemistry or other chemistries, which then gives you about 100 or so 80 antibodies uh, per, uh, sorry, anti atoms per antibody. So that is your signal. This replaces the fluorophore. And I want you to remember this number 180 because it comes important in a, in a couple of minutes. But then this then is the cloud, or this constitutes the cloud of ions, which is going to be measured uh, by the CYTOF or by the um, secondary ion mass spec. Right. So then we go, we nebulize the cells in uh, the plasma. Um, we nebulize the cells, put them into the plasma, they become a cloud of ions. The ions then are counted, calibrated, that would be once what was a cell. And then the problems begin, right? Because now you have this 45 or higher dimensional information which needs to be understood uh, in the context of what are the various cell populations and how might the values of the markers on or in those cells relate to each other. Uh, within the cell populations or, say, to a clinical outcome of the patients that you've been following over time. Uh, so we've got probably several hundred now antibodies working uh, in this, and this would be an example panel, 
right, uh, where we could measure every one of these proteins on or in a cell with enough surface markers to call out what the cell type is, be it an immune system cell or a cancer cell or various forms of cancer cells that we need to understand and then try to relate the biology of the marker expressions within them to each other to understand something about the mechanism. So as I said before, we can do both protein and RNA at the same time, and this is using uh, some of the uh, um, RLA uh, technology, the amplification technology, where we can look at the messenger RNA and protein at the same time if we want. And um, I'm just pointing this out as to capabilities. We can do multiple RNAs measured on a per cell basis as well. We, right now we're up to around 20 that can be measured quantitatively on a, on a per cell basis. Okay, so that's, that's the CYTOF technology, right? And we'll be getting into the computation in a minute. I just want to tell you something about the capabilities. Uh, the other technology that we published in Nature Medicine in March of this year is uh, multiplexed ion beam imaging, MIBI as we call it, uh, where we can take those exact same isotopes in the antibodies and or the RNAs, stain cells and tissue sections, and those can be uh, paraffin, archival material. There's nothing magic about what we have to do to the, uh, to the tissue itself. We stain it with all of the antibody panels that we've got, and now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be shooting ions, high-energy ions, uh, at the tissue, scraping off uh, a piece of the tissue about five nanometers, about half a molecule's depth at a time, uh, and then collecting the ions uh, in either a, 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 a magnetic sector device or uh, soon a TOF device, and then thinking of it as fluorophores. So the only thing we have to do different uh, after staining the tissue is to put it onto a conductive silicon substrate. Pretty easy, it's just a slide, right? Um, a kind of a slide. Uh, the tissue goes on to this. We, st we actually stain it ahead of time, uh, put them on the, on the slides. We use an ion gun. In this case, it's oxygen ions, but you can use a variety of different ions to shoot at the, at the device. And it, it literally is a beam, right? And the beams right now are about 100 to 200 nanometers wide, and we're moving towards a device that will be 5 to 10 nanometers, right? That's smaller than a molecule, your average antibody. Uh, wide, uh, and then what we do is we're dislodging, we're, well, we're, we're inflicting energy onto the substrate, we are charging the ions thereby, uh, shooting them off the substrate, uh, and then they're collected in a magnetic sector. And what's useful about this is about 5 to 10 percent efficient, right? So 5 to 10 percent of the ions that we dislodge are actually then collected and measured uh, when it gets to the other side of the instrument um, in the detectors. Why is, that in, why is that an important number? Well, remember the 180 molecules? So we're getting, let's say, anywhere from 10, uh, 5 to 10 over reading of every antibody molecule with its array of isotopes attached. So that's single molecule detection, and I'll show you that in a sec. Okay, so we were able to do with this first paper uh, basically 10 uh, different uh, antibodies done quantitatively at the same time. These are, of course, pseudocolor images. And it, what was nice about this is that we fooled the reviewers by coloring one of the markers that would have, they would have expected to be a peroxidase enzymatic stain uh, just by coloring it brown, and they, and they thought that this was actually peroxidase. Um, and in the, in the question and answer between the reviews and, and us back, they said, and they said, no, we're sorry, this was just a quantitative false color. This is actually not brown or browner, that's quantitative information. Uh, and we showed then that this is all uh, highly correlated with the expected values that you would want. The next panel that we're working on now for a quantitative viewing is all of this, right? So this would be a cancer panel where you can not only look at the markers that people think are interesting, but you can look at all the apoptotic markers, all the other cancer markers, the infiltrating immune system, et cetera, to measure all of this at the same time. So this was the uh, image that, again, thanks to a reviewer asking us the question, and when we realized that we had single molecule sensitivity, um, they asked us to show that every time that we went back to the image, uh, we would, or to the sample, uh, and scraping five to 10 nanometers each time, we would get the same answer. So unlike, say, ablative uh, um, imaging, which used, say, laser ablation, a former postdoc of mine, Bernd Bodenmiller at Zurich, has done that. Uh, they basically destroy the image 
uh, we go back and can look at it each time. And I asked the postdoc, I said, well, what do each of these dots represent? And that's where we started getting into the ion efficiency. Each of those dots is a single antibody that we're seeing. Uh, and we're moving down. Now, the issue is that the image size that we're picking out right now is about 100 or so nanometers, 100 or 200 nanometers. Uh, and that's about the size of the antibody with its isotope chains. Um, the new device that we're building, uh, the first version will be 30 to 40 nanometers, should be ready in February, and the five nanometer one should be ready next fall or so. We're basically having to get the ion beams tighter and tighter, uh, but that's what we're aiming to. So what can you do with that? Well, you can probably go in and do a molecule by molecule measurement of where any one of these molecules is in a cell. Once you get down to this kind of resolution, we're not limited to just a single isotope any longer. You could start thinking about barcoding those isotopes with multiple isotopes, which means really we have an unlimited number of channels that we can create uh, to be able to stain and image a cell. So one of my new uh, objectives actually is to say stain cells uh, and the DNA say with platinum, which would intercalate, and then antibodies, which would then bind to as many of these different uh, epigenetic markers as we want, and literally build a, an eight billion voxel image of a cell, uh, right down to the three-dimensional ultrastructure of what the DNA uh, and the proteins are as they are arrayed um, on top of the DNA. And of course, with the platinum, we can see the ultrastructural uh, tracing of where the, uh, where the DNA is. So this is what we're gonna be able to do. Okay, just jump over that. Okay, so the last sort of uh, capability is all of what we're doing is all automated so we can get through all of our samples automatically and get the variations out of the way uh, because we do a lot of clinical work with clinical samples and we wanna get the, the person and the technical capabilities out of the out of the variation because that ends up being, can be problematic. Okay, so once you get all this information, now you have to start partitioning it, right? You have to start arraying it and putting one kind of cell into a cluster with other ones. You can't, you, you can deal with every cell if you wanted to, but more often than not, computationally at least, it's important enough to think about cells as groupings. So whether you're an immunologist or a cell biologist, the first thing you do is you classify cells based on expression of proteins. And in most cases, it's been convenient over the last decade or several decades to classify them based at least first on surface markers. Um, but uh, it turns out that most of the clustering algorithms that have been out there have been, of course, applied mostly to gene expression arrays. Not much has been done except in the last decade in the flow cytometry area. So I'll touch upon a few of them that I won't even have time to go into in, a, in great depth. But if you scan across these papers here, you'll see uh, almost half of them, if not more, have been done with Donna Pierre at Columbia, who's been our uh, computational partner in crime. Um, a recent paper that came out that I won't even talk about, I don't even think Donna did either, in science basically uh, using wholly new ways on conditional probability to basically get at the signaling derivations of the, of, uh, the uh, heterogeneous markers. It just came out, I think it's still on Science Express right now. Uh, another way, that, that's basically getting at the signaling biology inside, and this follows on another science paper that we had uh, several years ago doing Bayesian inference at the single cell level, and this is a, going into much more depth. One of the other issues uh, that we've come up against and have to deal with is this notion of trajectories. In the, in the hierarchies of cells, right? Whether you're a cancer cell or whether you're your immune system, you generally are working in a hierarchy of one cell that becomes many others. And so one of the first orderings that you want to do uh, is to take those cells and order them across pseudotime. Uh, and uh, that uh, was done to great effect in a cell paper that we had together uh, in um, earlier this year as well. <laughs> I'll talk about this in a minute. This is the scaffold, nearly accepted in one of the big three. Uh, and I'll talk about um, some of these other things here. I won't talk about the uh, work using Visney that Donna's lab created, uh, just because there's not enough time, but I'll talk about some of these things and how we've been applying it to clinical samples. Okay, 
So one of the first issues that you have in a high dimensional space, so think of it as a point cloud in high D space where you've got clusters of cells that are more or less similar to each other. Remember, we're talking about a 45 or higher dimensional space, so the computational approaches need to be, uh, be better understood. You have to actually achieve two things at least. You need computational assuredness that the cell populations and clusters are real. And then you have to sort of even match the expectations of what uh, immunologists or cell biologists would do. Where would they find the edges of a population? And I'll tell you that the, the, the religious wars around clustering are, uh, are endless. So um, we've uh, applied basically nearly every algorithm that's out there. Nima Agapur is in my lab, and he's run a lot of the dream competitions for comparing these. Uh, and the one that I'll show you now is basically at the top of the list of those, or at near the top of the list, along with a few others, at uh, enabling this. But so one of the ways that we do it, we're, we're using a, a density estimate approach and a, basically a, you can think of it as a gravitational well, uh, and nearest neighbor approach is to find the clusters and merge clusters that are just, they look like they might be not uh, independent, but they're not. Um, and, and we've got a paper being written on this, but the long and the short of it is that by doing this kind of an approach and doing a tessellation uh, breakdown of the entire population, finding the modes and then merging modes that are frankly close to each other, we actually get a, a near uh, perfect match of human expectation as well as the computational expectations to find the unique populations, right, in high D space. And this is all done uh, quite readily now on, a, on a, a laptop. And when you do this and you apply it to a heterogeneous population such as those you would get from the immune system, we actually beautifully create and find uh, all of the classical cell subpopulations uh, within, the, uh, within the mouse that you would expect. Hope that's not gonna fall over. That, that's looking like it's about to fall over there. Um, and then using a variety of other approaches, we can now take those and then build them out into hierarchies uh, into uh, break them down into the various cell subsets and relate those cell subsets to each other, right? So while this might be something that somebody would do uh, by hand, I tell you that taking a standard 45-dimensional uh, plot and doing it by hand would take you about a month. So this uh, now is accomplished pretty readily and predictably and reproducibly now uh, in, in just a matter of about an hour with, the, with these newer approaches. So we break all of these things down. Now we wanna understand what is going on inside of the cells and how does that relate to say a clinical outcome or an experimental outcome. We'll get to that. So we either will uh, turn those clusters into, as I showed you now, minimum spanning trees or into the Tisney plots, uh, depending upon your, your desire. Um, and then the other way that you have to do this is that even when you found these uh, cell populations, the problem becomes relating two experimental uh, sets to each other or even comparing, say, the immune system within various tissues to each other. And so this is a, another system that we've developed called Scaffold. And the objective here is not only to relate the cell populations or the clusters that you find to each other, right, but then also to how to compare one cluster to another or one set of clusters to another, either between tissues within, a, within uh, an animal or across animals or even across species. So it turns out that by using a gravimetric approach, we are able to actually beautifully accomplish all of those things without uh, too much ado. So what we do is we create reference populations. So these would be cell populations that the immunologist, for instance, would call out as the standard landmarks in the immune system. These would be then automatically found cell populations. So these are an objective finding of the cell populations as well as all the ones that you're not looking at in high dimensions. We put the landmark nodes together with the unsupervised nodes and we basically just do a force directed graph, which I don't need to explain to the likes of you. Um, and so I do have to do that to immunologists though and it kind of twists their head sideways thinking about, the, about that. Um, so we get, of course, an arrangement uh, 
uh, of the uh, cells in this high dimensional, well, in this force directed plot. The landmarks are basically are meant to draw uh, the researcher's eyes towards the known major cell subsets. Uh, and then the blue nodes are all of the things that uh, either partly constituted the landmark or if they're slightly far away from the landmark, they would be uh, considered novel cell populations. And the paper that we've written on it are actually starting to, are exploring some of these that are falling off the, off the mode here uh, and finding some very interesting biology that obviously they don't have time to go into. But what was unique about this uh, is that once you have uh, a, a map or a, a structure, a framework, it turns out that you can now start to come in with, that might have been derived from the bone marrow, we can take the spleen, do an objective, no landmarks, just objective view uh, or clustering, uh, and lo and behold, the cells find themselves where they should, and when they fall off, uh, they are unique. You can mouse over these nodes. There are hundreds or thousands of cells per each of these blue dots, and it can bring up all of the two-dimensional information uh, or other associated metadata that is associated with those cells. Um, lungs, interestingly, and some new dendritic cell populations. So it works quite nicely, and even it can go from using the Cytoff data that created this, we can go and do fluorescence data, and it actually auto-normalizes. So we can take cross-platform, right, basically using a wholly different platform, the cells find the right landmark. So basically you can think of it this way, that with enough landmarks put around the map, right, either developed by us or in a community-directed uh, effort, anybody could come, even with archival data from 20 or 30 years ago, like my first fax experiment ever, put this onto the map, and like the human uh, genome reference map, it would find itself by homology, if you will, homology of similarity of the cell populations. And you can say, okay, well, this cell population is related to this, uh, and we can start to talk about uh, using data um, from across the decades, uh, all in the context of a single experimental platform. Um, and remarkably, doing it, we originally did it with mouse, we could even take human data with the same markers and it also auto-normalizes. So you have a cross-platform, cross-species, cross-tissue normalization, as well as a reference map approach, which our objective is to start to assign all of the other metadata that you might think is interesting, papers, other people's uh, thoughts, uh, so that we can have an all-in-one human system, human immune system reference map. Okay, so that's one of the auto, so th those are all the computational tricks and organizational principles that we've set up. Now I'll start applying it to cancer. So ovarian cancer is a, a focus in our laboratory. We, of course, have done hematopoietic cancers, but we decided a few years ago to start to, uh, you know, get into the, into the solid tumors. Um, and, you know, people still think about cancer as a hierarchy as well. You start with a stem cell uh, and then, uh, you know, in a normal tissue, something goes wrong, the cell starts to change, it expands its state space. In the process of expanding, expanding this state space, new opportunities arise. Uh, and uh, essentially what happens is as, as the cells begin the domino effect of genomic changes uh, and epigenetic changes, you vastly expand the state space and you end up with a tumor, right? Um, the issue is that I don't think any, is it, anybody would disbelieve that somewhere in this tumor there still exists a hierarchy. Right, so the question is, can we use all of the same principles and techniques and tricks that I've just showed you for normality and apply this now to, uh, to cancer? Um, and so I'm going to be talking about uh, patients where the materials that we get from these patients are obtained and processed within four hours. Uh, after getting them. We found, obviously, that the time from surgical resection to creation of the single cell suspensions or getting them onto tissue blocks is quite important because, obviously, things go wrong when tissue doesn't get oxygen or it sits out on a bench top. Actually, the biggest problem has not been the desire of surgeons to do it, but it's the, it's the ability of the surgeon to pick up the phone uh, and call you uh, to tell you that the sample's ready.
Um, so our answer has been to actually place a nurse uh, associated with us directly into the surgical suite uh, and then to process it from the get-go. So here uh, is an example of the panel that we've been using on our uh, ovarian cancer, right? So surface markers that mark out the EMT transition, uh, mesenchymal uh, transition, right? Intracellular proteins related to apoptosis signaling, uh, um, pluripotency, et cetera. That's the tumor panel. We also have an immune antibody panel right, which is gonna call out all of the cell subsets and their associated signaling states. These are the sort of the summation of the ones that are the best uh, reflectors of the state of the cells or the immune cells biology. So every sample is measured with both of these panels. Unfortunately, we have to do two different panels, not simultaneous right now, but our objective is to merge these all into one mega panel once all the isotopes are working correctly. Um, and then we uh, take, in this case it was 10 uh, samples, but we've done something similar with 40 uh, ovarian cancer samples. Uh, and the answer is interestingly the same. Uh, and we've seen the same thing, and I think uh, Donna might have alluded to this yesterday in the AML talk, is that despite the fact that these cancers have an extraordinary set of differences in their underlying genetics, Right, the number of phenotypes that they seem enabled or capable of producing is limited. So although you've got 10 samples uh, and somebody would, you, you might think that the cells are going in all kinds of directions, in fact, there's only a limited repertoire of the kinds of phenotypic opportunities to which they have access. Right, so, um, and that is observable here in these 10 samples. Uh, there's only about 80 or so different cell subsets that they can become. And these 80 or so cell subsets are, of course, related by um, similarity matrix, uh, and they, they appear to be basically a lineage. Um, and so once you break them down into these lineages of cells that are similar or not to each other, you start to discover something interesting about each patient, right? So although the universe of possibilities is largely filled out to a greater or lesser extent, each patient only calls out a major region within this, right? But repeated major regions, right? This one patient here is the relapse, and you can see how different she is in this case from the others. Uh, and the way that we use these bubbles and in these, uh, these uh, maps is that we would then color by, in some cases, just a single marker, or other times it's ratios of markers. So here's the E cadherin which is a hallmark of epithelial compartment, right? And that's the relative amount of expression of this in each of these. It's obviously very low down here because this is the, uh, another compartment. This is part of the transition to the EMT. And so there's vermentin, which is the hallmark of the mesenchymal component. And you can see that in the case of the relapse patient, she's entirely positive for this. Uh, the cancer therapy has killed off in this individual all of the cells that were over here. But you can look now across the rest of the cells uh, in each of these other patients, and you can see that you know, the harbinger of future problems is already waiting in the patient, right? This is the relative amount of the cells that are either endothelial or mesenchymal, right? But the mesenchymal transition is basically waiting uh, to uh, come back here as reflected by this one uh, relapse patient. Of course, we've got a lot of other things that we've measured, right? So we've got uh, SNAIL as an um, example uh, of, a, of a transcription factor that marks that transition. And you can find that there are, are the cells in these two different compartments that are expressing uh, SNAIL. Now, uh, what's interesting is that SNAIL was not used to create these bubbles, only surface markers was used, and yet the surface markers uh, reproducibly call out the SNAIL expression in the same, in the same subsets uh, across each of these different um, patients. So this, whatever this is, it's a cell that is probably uh, the uh, spawn or the spawning point for the rest of this part of the, of, of the curve. Uh, and you can see actually there's also some EMT expression in here that uh, connects the, the two modes. So snail seems to be coming back on again over here. Um, here's a Yamanaka factor, right? This is a pluripotency marker. And again, we find them 
in two areas of the, of the map. We always find it up here, and then we find it over here. Again, remember, this is, where the, this is where the snail was, so this further confirms for us that this is probably a stem cell-like phenotype over in this area. Now, what's useful about this is that once you find these, we have other algorithms which would then tell you what are the best surface markers that you might use to sort those cells. Right, so we can sort those cells and get at the intracellular RNA from those uh, to then do uh, genomic analysis as well. So you can bounce back and forth between the technologies. Um, you can do this on Cytoff. Cytoff tells you which markers and which cell subsets then would be clinically or otherwise relevant for further analysis. You then go back to another sample, of course, stain those cells with fluorescence markers, go to the cell sorter, sort those cells, uh, and then do further analysis on, say, the RNA within them, right? And then here's Mick. Interestingly, there's that relapse patient, uh, and you can see that Mick is obviously important for the biology of those. You can do a variety of classification approaches to take all of the data. So all of the things that you guys are accustomed to, be do to doing with genomic expression can be applied directly to the protein expression that you see here. We don't have as many markers as you would have, say, for RNA, but we have the cell numbers that allow you to do, uh, make other kinds of inferences about cell subsets, right, that uh, most RNA expression profiles can't do, right? You're only doing a few hundred cells at a time. So there's, I think, power to both, to both platforms. Um, and then the interesting part now is about, if you're thinking about there's the, you've got the immune system and then you have the tumor. Right, so are there immune system cell subcompartments that are telling you something about particular tumor cell subsets? And are there tumor cell subsets that contra are telling you something about the immune system? So this, is, this data is only about uh, three weeks old, so we're still diving into it. But we have enough markers that allow us to call out the tumor, the immune system cells and subsets thereof, the angiogenic and stromal, and just the stromal cell. Uh, so all of these are all measurable and discernible at the same time. And this is just looking at you know, 10 or 12 or so of the patients. And the obvious variety uh, of what you, what you get. So here, for instance, obviously this patient, most of what they have is tumor. Uh, and the other uh, cell compartments are minimal. But on the other hand, you can go here and look at this patient and this patient, and more than half of her tumor is the immune system, right? So there's a lot of variety here. Uh, and n none of these markers, by the way, are sufficient to call out the long-term uh, outcome for these patients. Um, so we can do all kinds of uh, appropriate regressions and analyses and find cell subsets, immune cell subsets, that correlate with compart tumor compartment size and particular tumor cell subsets. So there's some kind of a conversation going on between the tumors, of course, and the immune system. Obviously, the majority of it is that the tumor is trying to tell the immune system to leave me alone or feed me, right, do something that helps me. So we want to be able to start to find out and call out, well, what are the attributes of one cell compartment that are telling us something about what the other cell compartment should or is doing? Uh, so, uh, obviously, I won't go into the, into the details of it, but suffice to say, we can do it, and this is one of many cluster combinations that we can find where, the, uh, where we can find uh, these correlations. And then the inverse is that, of course, we can find tumor clusters that correlate to the immune compartment as well. So, um, you can go both ways, and obviously, some of these correlations are pretty darn good. Uh, so what it means yet, we don't know. It's phenomenology at this point. It's not mechanism as of yet. Uh, obviously, we're going to move to that. Um, but the, the next level up that you want to understand um, is are there particular cell subsets or attributes of some of these clusters or combinations of clusters that are telling me something about the outcome of the patient? Uh, now, we don't have that yet for tumors, but I'm going to show you a paper we just published a, a couple of weeks ago in Science Translational Medicine uh, looking at surgical recovery. So who here has had a hip replacement? Who here is planning to have a hip replacement? Darn, I was going to recruit you for our next uh, study. So this was the work of an anesthesiologist in my lab who actually uh, came originally to study the effect of drugs, um, anesthesia, on the immune system. But when we got to talking about it, 
we said, well, you know, maybe, maybe we should also understand what the effect of trauma is, right? What's, what's, the, what's the trauma's effect on the immune system, right? What happens? So it turns out that nicely, uh, um, hip replacement is a pretty regularized uh, surgery where even with, at least within a given hospital, the protocols are fairly similar. So we selected for patients that were not otherwise, uh, did not otherwise have compounded problems of diabetes or other health issues. Uh, we had about 30 patients for the study. And what we did was we followed their immune system one day before, an hour into the therapy, into the surgery. So the, the knife hits the, hits the skin, and an hour into that, we take their blood. 24 hours, 72, three weeks, basically a time series of blood and a day-by-day -day time series of how they were feeling, right, and what their progression was, how much better they were getting. So we start with, we can take actually all of the um, patient's bloods. We do uh, a bar coating, a color coating, or an isotope coating of those. Those are then mixed so that when we do the staining, uh, we're mixing uh, and staining for the same, you know, in the same tube. We debarcode later. Um, we go to the Cytoff, do data normalization, we debarcode, uh, and then we do the analysis. And the objective here is to ask whether there are any of these cell subsets or any of the attributes therein, right, of each of these many cell subsets that you get from the immune system, this is from the blood, that's going to tell us something about the clinical outcome of the patients. So we have three different um, normalized uh, measurements that we take for the, um, all of these patients. Post-operative fatigue, right, basically, do I feel yucky today? Do I want to get out of bed? Uh, functional impairment, how much can I actually move, right, which is distinct from how, how icky do I feel? Uh, and then pain, which is measured both in that, you know, a 1 to 10 scale, how bad is this pain? And then uh, it's actually backed up by how much pain medication you are asking to take or claimed to be taking. So what we do is we break down the clusters. We had another paper in PNAS just this summer showing how we basically can use this then to do a regularized analysis and regression of these against a clinical outcome. This was done with Rob Tip Sharani. Uh, so that, 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 that's my claim to uh, it, it is statistically sound. Um, uh, and then we do the analysis and surprisingly, the same cell subset came up each time capable of predicting an outcome for your surgery, right? But it was a different transcription factor in those cells at each time that was telling us what the outcome was. It turns out that the cells that seem to be most important for this that are correlated are called myeloid suppressor cells, which interestingly basically found most of their uh, recent fame in the cancer cell field as being uh, something akin to the Tregs at keeping the immune system at bay or at least suppressing the immune system's response. So these are, it turns out, the first cells that we pick up as being mobilized post-surgery, right? They are the biggest cell population that's on the move the moment the knife hits the skin, the moment there's a trauma. And as it turns out that if you look at one hour versus 24 hour, the ratio of those two proteins, uh, of, those two, of those two times, and the phosphostat-3 expression within those cells in the monocyte subpopulation tells you 50% global function, right? That's, sorry, that's uh, whited out. Another one for CREB tells me something about how much pain medication you're going to take. And this is the uh, mild impairment. So we can basically tell you how long you're going to be in the hospital. Um, what's interesting about this is that uh, if you take a step back and you look at what is, the, what is the global predictor of what's going on, it's actually, so basically you can think of yourself as being, having a normal immune system. So this might be your homeostatic equilibrium. You're perturbed, your immune system goes off base, right? Presumably you're starting to do tissue injury fixing and this is sort of the first response. The immune system kind of bounces around over time. And it turns out that the closer you get, perhaps not surprisingly, to your original start point at three weeks is the predictor of how long it's going to take for you to, to get better, right? So your, what it's telling you is that your immune system, as it turns out, is pre-configured 
to tell you how long it's going to be until you get better. We actually can now take the pre-blood alone and pick out one of those three quite nicely. Right? So your immune system is pre-configured, so it tells you that there's something about who and what you are and what your recent past has been that can, that can basically tell you how long you're going to be in the hospital, which tells us that we can probably change that. Right? Meaning that if you uh, modify your behavior prior to surgery, you might actually be able to affect your outcome. And obviously one of the objectives of this for us is to determine whether or not which any of these cell subsets and then are basically cause as opposed to effect, and whether interfering with any of the immune states during the course of the trauma will allow us to get better or worse, uh, better, say with drug intervention. So, to take this and to move it back to the ovarian cancer, we're actually already starting to work now with the ovarian cancer surgeons to see if we can do the same kind of study with ovarian cancer outcome and relate the surgical trauma and how much it takes it to get better, right? And will this, is there something in the immune system that's actually going to tell us something about whether you get better or worse during cancer surgery? Uh, and can you get then all the way to um, changing the intervention? Already the hospital administrators are interested in this because they see this as an opportunity to predict how many beds they're going to need. I call this the fiber test, right? Basically, I'm going to tell you whether or not you're a whiner uh, and whether you should be out of bed or not and stop, lo stop lounging about. Your immune system tells me you're better, right? So, and this is the cell subset uh, showing all of this. Um, and I'm going to skip over this for the basis of time, just because I know that I'm, I'm over. So our objective in all of this uh, is to build a modular view of the immune system and how the cells are interacting with each other, right? And this is part of an FDA-funded project that's ending this year, but it was a $2.5 million project to do uh, a couple of hundred mice, 50 of each of those monkey species, uh, as well as humans, uh, and to build out a modular relationship across all of these, to build the human immune system reference map so you can have an interrogative way to interact with the data, basically moving up the evolutionary tree to our distant future, uh, the alien greys. Uh, and, uh, but unfortunately, the Republican sequester and furloughs took the money out of that, so we can't work with these. And we're having a hard time recruiting these guys. They don't show up when we ask. Okay, so where are we? Um, it's all about the single cell analysis. And again, I'd like to use this as a, as, a, um, as a goal for people doing the single cell gene expression because the sorts of things that we can do with only a few proteins at the tens of thousands of cells level, once gene expression gets to that level, I mean, all bets are off and the kinds of things that can be done. So I'm actually hopeful for the community at large to be able to move towards, we're only doing you know, a few dozen proteins. We're more coming with these encoding systems, we'll be able to jump to much higher numbers per cell, messenger RNA, as I mentioned, the immune system reference map. And again, uh, once you get this kind of precise information and data. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, fun statistics and mechanism that can be done. Some of my students developed a large online database system called Cytobank, which lets you do a lot of the stuff. So all of our techniques, as much as we can reasonably do, go into that. It's, an, it's now actually an outside company. Uh, doing things. We actually have seven of these CYTOFs on campus. We have the one MIBI uh, device, which is actually over in the geology departments. We have to fight with the people measuring meteorite isotope ratios to get on the machine. But we're building the new machines uh, that uh, will probably only cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars each, um, given the uh, ramp up speed we think we can get to. So I think the, the, the future is, is bright uh, for the kinds of um, imaging modalities. And frankly, this is quite competitive uh, in the, you know, to fluorescence because we're not, again, limited by the spectra. Uh, we can do kinds of encoding that people just frankly can't do with fluorescence. Um, so uh, thankful to my laboratory. I called out most of the people's work as I was going along. Mike and Sean now both, Sean, assistant professor over in pathology, Mike Angelo setting up to be Similo. He did the, he did the MIBI. He's also over in pathology. Now, the, uh, the various um, uh, proximity ligations, the ovarian cancer group, Martin Angst, with whom we did all of the pain 
So basically, he runs the pain lab, so angst and pain. He runs the pain lab. Jonathan Barrick, head of, uh, and Oliver DeRigo, who are um, ovarian cancer surgeons. Uh, ben Neal, uh, a lot of input as well on markers for ovarian cancer. And then the rest of the students and postdocs whose uh, work I touched on. And of course, thank you to our funding agencies. Thank you very much. And intracellular phosphoproteins, right? Or transcription factors or yeah, proteins. My question, my question is when you start relating the two, mm -hmm. how much are you know, we invisible? Basically, how, how much of what's going on inside the cell is actually invisible to what you're showing us here? Mm -hmm. Whereas, mm -hmm. if you take subsets of your markers mm -hmm. and you do the clustering on that subset, you, get, you, get, the you so get the same picture. You get the same picture. How many markers do you need before you find that structure? About 20, it turns out. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. If you think that you're saturating right. 20. Well, so I, I think the question would be what's the, what's the purpose of the saturation? If the purpose of the saturation is surrogacy, right, is to find the sets of markers that are surrogate or what's a minimal number for a biological outcome, you can get the same structure, but it's not telling you the same biology. Right, so but fi figuring out which markers are surrogates of each other or which in combination work with each other tells you something I think about the mechanism. And so, yeah, phenomenon is not mechanism, but so adding the markers, uh, to me at least, is valuable because, you know, we can get the same structure by the surface, but we don't see the same thing intracellularly. If I use the intracellular markers, I get a wholly different arrangement because, of course, that's a, that's a transcellular phenomenon, right? The, basically, the, the, the signaling system within one cell type does not relate to the, where the cell sits in the hierarchy uh, as well as, say, does the surface markers. There are certain intracellular markers which do, like the Yamanaka factors, can actually be used fairly reproducibly independent of the, um, of the hierarchy to tell you are you early, middle, or late, right? But that doesn't tell you anything about what happens in brain versus immune system. And I guess a related question is what is the right resolution at which we should be thinking of this? In other words, with gene expression, sure, we're measuring 20,000 genes, and then, you know, mm -hmm. you can cluster all these in modules, and it turns out there's only a few sort of modules out there that right. behave in correlated ways. I mean, can you get a little bit of that? We definitely are getting that sense with the immune system. There's, a, you know, there's several thousand cell subsets, but they um, don't all act independently. So, for instance, there are, there are macrophage modules which seem to act like T cell modules, and then there's these new cells that are innate uh, things that have just been discovered that seem to look like either innate or um, adaptive depending upon the circumstance. And so, you know, I think we have to lay it out first and get a sense before we say, okay, enough. We only need this. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. What a terrific uh, amount and uh, depth of work. I'm intrigued by the uh, single molecule um, technology that you mentioned. A couple of questions about that. Um, one is, well, are you using um, helium ion beam or um, electron beam? To, well, what is, uh, so um, it's either cesium or uh, oxygen, or those are the two main ones that most of, but you can, there's a variety of other ions that you can use. I should say the sensitivity comes from the fact that everything here is done in a vacuum, whereas most other uh, mass spectrometry technologies, you have the atmospheric pressure to vacuum transition where you lose a lot of the ions. Right. And uh, the time uh, that you need to scan the whole sample mm -hmm. it may become a limitation here. So right. how, how, how do you overcome that? So, the, so the, oh, the first instrument that we did took an afternoon to measure, say, a centimeter squared. So you overcome it with ion beam strength. 
right? So basically, the faster you shoot the ions at the sample, and then the faster, of course, you move them so you don't bore through the sample to the bottom, uh, then the faster you can pick up uh, uh, the ions on the other side. And so the TOF that we've put on here, that we're putting on here, that will measure more ions in the magnetic sector is sufficient with about 100,000 hertz you know, to capture the ions as they're flowing through. Um, so we think, well, we calculate that we can get 10 to 20 samples centimeter squared done per day. So this, we believe, will be a pathology level service um, given what we think we can do. Because we can move the, the nice thing is that we can move the ion beam around magnetically. So if you couple that to a transition, so stage that, that moves, um, we actually can move, we believe, molecule by molecule in our scans. And the, and the depth as well. So we can basically, if you reside or use a stronger beam at any given point, you can bore into the, two, into the sample as, as deep as you want or you know, only a few nanometers. Thanks for a terrific talk. You gave us a lot to think about. In your example in the ovarian cancer, where you were looking at the compartment sizes, mm -hmm. immune compartment versus angiogenesis compartment, for example, it struck me that the, compart that the samples would lower tumor load, so the tumor compartment was smaller. Mm -hmm. The angiogenesis and the immune seem to be balanced. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you simply took away the tumor component of that yeah. and looked at the other components yeah. independent of tumor, do you see new and interesting Great biology? Great question. My, you know, so I, I am struggling first with the number of questions that we can ask and second, struggling with the postdocs and now new assistant professor, Wendy Fantel, who's gonna be spinning out of my lab as well to the other, another department in the school to let the data be free, right? Um, and I think this is a question that is, is a computational, this is a larger question for the community, which is define what your answers are that you want to know, and then put the rest of the data out because you can't do it all. Um, and so that would be you know, my only answer because we can't do it all. And I was glad to see the angiogenesis markers that were mm -hmm. up there. That was not a big focus as you were introducing your panel. And I wondered, have you thought about adhesion? And especially for neurons. So for example, right. looking at CADM families and mm -hmm. contactin families right. of molecules. So we haven't now, but I think that, I mean, it partly gets to Manolis's question, but it also it gets to, um, you know, uh, the Cytoff data was all done on suspension cells, so we have to dissociate the cells. And you can imagine the, you know, the heartburn that causes some people in trying to interpret what, you know, actually was originally the tumor, which is, of course, the reason for moving to the, um, the tissue section approach. And hopefully, the ability to do an unlimited number of markers with the barcoding of the, the spatially resolved barcoding approach, where we could have thousands of, of, as many antibodies as we can get into a stain, would let us then answer all the kinds of additional questions, such as what you ask. So I think we are running quite late, so we should probably move on. Thanks again to Gary. <laughs>